Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 104 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Now, today's episode is going to be more of a personal episode and a bit more random than usual <laughs> because, as you know, I've been very, very busy these days, and that's one of the reasons I didn't have a podcast last week. I've been really working hard on my new book, which is called How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, and I figure you can't write a book of advice on how to live a better life unless you actually walk the walk, and so <laughs> with all of the projects that were going on in my life, I was getting to a point where I needed to just rest so I could get my creativity back, and so that's what I did last week. The book is coming along really well, and I'm very, very pleased with it. I hope you'll like it as well. It comes out on October 12th of this year, and uh, you can already pre-order it on Amazon. So How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. And the beginning of that wisdom is to actually take care of yourself. <laughs> so I'm trying to walk the walk here, which is why you didn't have a podcast last week. This week's podcast, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the other stuff I do. In the main, I'm going to be talking about the Medieval Masterclass for Creators, which is something that I made and I'm very proud of. And I, I have a whole bunch of other instructors that help me to create content that allows fiction writers and graphic novelists and people who are just making stuff that's based on the Middle Ages to make that better, to make it three-dimensional, to make it more authentic. So that's one of the projects that I worked on. And so I'm going to be a little bit personal today and talk to you a little bit about my process. People ask me a lot about how to become a public historian, and that's something that I hope to create a class around as well to kind of help people with that too. So the Medieval Masterclass for Creators is the only course that I'm running right now, but I plan to make more of them as the year goes on, always paying attention to the advice that I've just written in a book. Um, so it's going to take some time. And uh, you just need to stay tuned to the podcast if you're interested in perhaps taking a course later on. I plan to make one about public history, so we'll see. Especially now that I've announced it out loud, I guess I better actually go and do it. But I wanted to talk about the Medieval Masterclass today because one of the things that I do in it is to answer people's questions. And I know that the Medieval Masterclass is not going to be something for everybody because not everybody's creating fiction but some of the stuff that I've dug up in my attempts to help these fiction creators is stuff that I thought I might share with you as well so part of the process in the medieval masterclass for creators is not only do I share objects for you to see so you can describe them or draw them in your fiction but I also answer questions and help people's plot points and of course that's the stuff that I love to do for the podcast as well so I thought today we will go through some of the questions that I get asked in the course of the Medieval Masterclass for Creators, because I think this information is really interesting. And then if you think that that is a course that you'd be interested in, I'll tell you more about the actual course at the end of the podcast. So let's get started. Most of the people that take the Medieval Masterclass are novelists, and they are writing in Medieval Europe for the most part, which works for me because that is my specialty, but it's still a thousand years in an entire continent. So the daily stuff that they ask me about I often have to research, and so I learn more. And when I learn more, of course, I like to share it with you. So let's get to some of the questions that people ask me during the course of the Medieval Masterclass. The first one that I want to bring to you is someone asked me, would it be authentic to have people who are characters in the book that have last names and then other characters that don't have last names? And this is a really interesting question because naming your characters is such an important part of the process, right? These are the characters that you have to get to know over the course of the novel. So it's important to name them well. And I mean, in some cases, it's fairly easy in the Middle Ages because you can just name them John or Henry or Richard or William. And there you go, <laughs> Mary, you've covered all the bases. But this question of surnames is really interesting. In most of the Middle Ages, people didn't have kind of official surnames because remember at this time, there wasn't as much paperwork as there is today, right? So you didn't have birth certificates. You didn't have driver's licenses, for example, that we have today. So you didn't need a surname most of the time. So what kind of surnames did people have? Well, they were ones that would refer to their relationships in the community. So their family relationships or perhaps their professions. And often you wouldn't really have an idea of what this was unless People needed to write it down. For example, if someone was a witness in a trial, then you might have a last name or a gesture to a last name, especially as the Middle Ages went on. So we're talking late 14th and into the 15th century. But much of the time, 
people didn't really have surnames, so they didn't really use them. And so what I said to this person is, it's totally authentic if some people have surnames and some people don't. And really, you want to think about the context in which people are using surnames, because today we will more often talk about someone's relationship in the community. So like Richard's brother, John, instead of actually talking about their surname. We still do this, right? We're saying like Jack the plumber or like Mildred the electrician. We don't often use surnames when we're talking to each other. And so it's perfectly okay to write dialogue when you're writing fiction that doesn't refer to people's surnames. I think as historians, you know, it can be really tricky when you're trying to trace people because they don't use surnames a lot. So if you're creating fiction, yeah, you can totally have a mix of surnames and no surnames, especially if you're talking about the early Middle Ages. Another question that I thought was really interesting was, did widows wear black? And this is a question that was related to someone who was working on the late uh, 14th and early 15th century in France. So of course, I was able to go and look at one of the most famous widows of that time, who was Christine de Pizan. She talks about wearing black as a widow. So we know that they were wearing it. You know, this is somebody who's saying this out loud. She's, she's wearing black. But there is research to suggest that people were wearing black as widows. But remember, people didn't have a lot of clothing at this time. So if you had black, you could wear black. And someone like Christine, who's kind of further up the social ladder, could afford to have black. Fortunately, you can get black wool from black sheep. So it doesn't always have to be expensive. But it seems that in France, in the late Middle Ages, for sure, people were wearing black uh, when they were widows. And this goes back to the ancient world. It's not just a medieval tradition. And the period seems to be for about a year and I'll give you a reference for that in the show notes on Medievalist.net. But it seems to be that widows would wear black for about a year following old, old tradition so that you were giving the proper respect and showing really critically in the Middle Ages, showing everyone what your status was through your clothing so that people could tell at a glance what your marital status was. So women who were younger would let their hair down, let it loose, not necessarily cover it. Women who were married would have their hair up and they'd have it covered and widows would be wearing black if it's a recent death, at least of their husbands. So I thought that was a really interesting question that I would bring to you as well. And speaking of things that are related to women and their daily life, someone asked me a question about breastfeeding. And this is really interesting as well, because this is something that is obviously a huge part of women's life, especially in the time before a formula. And so what would happen with women? Were they breastfeeding at this time? What was the tradition? So I will give you some links to this as well. But it turns out, yes, women were breastfeeding a lot, especially people who were lower than the queen. Her job was to create heirs, right? So breastfeeding is a natural contraceptive, at least to a point. It's not 100% effective. Like most contraceptives are not 100% effective. This isn't either. But it's easier to conceive if you're not breastfeeding. So queens would farm that out to wet nurses. But many women, if not most women, were breastfeeding their own children. And again, following the ancient wisdom, so stuff that is coming to medieval Europe from Romans and Greeks and through the Islamic world, the suggestion is to breastfeed for at least one year and up to three years. There is one source, which I will have to note for you, that says, you know, Two years is good enough for a girl. Three would be better for a boy, <laughs> which kind of reflects, you know, medieval attitudes about this. In the show notes, I'll give you the, the scholar who's gotten into Spain. She really talks about how women, if they were widowed and they had a young baby or they were about to give birth, there was social support in that the family would help the widow financially to make sure that if she couldn't breastfeed herself, that she had a wet nurse to take care of the children. So there was social support from the family and the community to make sure that child was breastfed. Breastfeeding is a simple thing until you try it yourself and then you realize that it can be actually really tricky. It doesn't sound like it, but it can be really tricky. And in the modern world, we can supplement with formula, no problem. And we have milk that is from cows and it's pasteurized, which makes a big difference. In the Middle Ages, the animal milk was not pasteurized. So I'm wondering if that maybe had something to do with infant mortality as well. If the baby couldn't be breastfed by the mother or by a wet nurse, the options for having a source of food outside of a human is actually very, very difficult. But yes, 
peasants were breastfeeding for about a year, it looks like, up to three years, I would think that this would be kind of a, an easier way to keep your baby fed, especially if you don't have a lot of extra food, you can breastfeed as a way to supplement the food that the babies are getting as they're getting older as well. So yeah, women were breastfeeding for, it looks like, between one and three years, as long as they weren't royals or people who needed to have heirs as part of their role in the community. I love really practical questions about how things were done in the Middle Ages. And someone asked me, how do they waterproof things? Which is a good question, especially if you are writing fiction about or looking into a place that's really wet, like the UK, for example, or Ireland. How did people waterproof things? Well, wool is a great way to actually keep yourself pretty dry. I had a friend that was in fashion when I was younger and they talked about wool in their program and talked about how wool can actually absorb something like one third of its weight and still keep you dry. So wool is great on its own. It has its own oils. It's very absorbent and it keeps you from getting super wet. But if someone is out there and they're wearing wool, they're in better shape than if somebody is not wearing wool, they're wearing linen or something like that. They're gonna be soaked pretty fast. But how did they waterproof other things? Well, they waterproofed roofs with pitch, if they had pitch available, ships with oakum, if they had that available. If you have cloth, you could use linseed oil or you could use beeswax. And this is one of the ways in which people are coming back to old traditions in, in making their lives better. Beeswax is one of the things that you can cover a cloth with these days and keep your food in better shape Rather than using plastic wrap or containers, you can use beeswax on a cloth. So how could you waterproof things? Well, beeswax, linseed oil, these are good things, oakum and pitch if you have it. So these are all ways you could waterproof all your stuff. A very topical question that I was asked was specific to England and Cambridge, even more particularly, was a question about whether fairs were canceled during the Black Death. This is a big question. I mean, I live in Ontario and we're looking at another big lockdown across the province. So what was happening during the plague? Did people actually have to cancel their fares? So I didn't know this off the top of my head. This is pretty specific information. So I asked my friend John Lee, who was on the podcast not too long ago talking about the medieval clothier. And he told me that because fares were something that were uh, mandated by the king, if you needed to cancel a fare, you needed that king's permission. So he told me that there there seems to be no evidence that the fairs in medieval England were cancelled outright in the face of the Black Death, but it seems likely that the people in England would be hearing about this plague coming. They would have heard about it in advance, well in advance, and so it's very likely that people continued to go to fairs for financial reasons, which is something that, I mean, we're all familiar with today, right? Balancing health with financial health. So people probably did go to the market in smaller numbers. So balancing that out, what is the risk versus what is the risk of, you know, starvation if you can't make enough money from your market trips. So it seems that at least in England, from what I've been able to find out, the fairs weren't actually canceled in the face of the Black Death. But if you are somebody who's writing about this time, I would say it's very logical to assume that fewer people would have been at the fair than were the year before. Because like I said, the rumors about the plague would have been already in England at that time and people would have been concerned about it from having heard what was going on on the continent. A fun question that I was asked was about shaving. This is another question where you don't really come across information about it necessarily, but it's something that your characters in fiction are going to be doing all the time, right? Especially if you're creating a TV show or something your character is probably going to shave at some point or you might just kind of let that fly under the radar. So this is a question about a soldier specifically. So for a soldier, it's pretty easy. You have a knife with you all the time and you have it sharp all the time because you need that for warfare. So that is a way that you could actually shave. That wouldn't get you the best shave ever. For that, you want a professional. And fortunately, people who are essential to the army that were not necessary combatants were barbers because barbers were people who were not only great at shaving, which an entire army full of men will need, but they were also surgeons as well. So barbers were part of the army, 
So they weren't just people who followed opportunistically, like we talked about with Kelly and Michael in the last episode, but they were actually part of the army. So if you were a soldier, and again, professional soldiers were not really a thing unless you were a mercenary in the Middle Ages, but if you were conscripted to fight, you could get a close shave from a barber in the army camp while you're besieging someone, or you could use a knife for it as well. We know that people used scissors as well to trim their beards. So you could use scissors or you could use a fine blade like a regular razor, straight razor, to shave yourself or just a knife. These things would work. But if you wanted a really good shave, you would go to the barber, of course. And if you needed surgery or dental work, you could also go to the barber. Maybe you could get that all done on the same appointment. I'm kidding. Another question was, What kind of jewelry did peasants wear? And this is a good question because a lot of the jewelry that survives is the stuff that the elites were wearing, right? Stuff made from precious metals. And part of that is because if something is made from precious metals, we want to save it. We want to keep it. And so a lot of the examples that we have are ones from the elites. But what were peasants wearing to decorate themselves? And I think that it's fair to say, and this is something I say pretty often, that people were decorating themselves however they could, however they wanted to. Human beings love to decorate themselves. I mean, this is just something that is kind of essential to our nature. We like adornments. So whatever you could afford to put on your body, you could do that. So for peasants, it doesn't have to be precious jewels or anything. We all know how beautiful things that are carved from wood can be. Things that are made from pressed leather can be. Glass beads you could wear. You could wear stuff that had been embroidered or tied. So ribbons, something that you can make uh, into adornment. Hair combs. People loved all this kind of stuff. And it was not necessarily stuff that was just for elites. Because it doesn't have to be stuff that's made from precious metals, for example. So one of the people who is a teacher in the medieval masterclass for creators is Katrin Kanya. And she is a textile expert. And the stuff she comes up with is amazing. She shows you all the different dyes you can make. The colors from plants are just spectacular. And one of the things she shows is how you can actually tie to make edging for your garments just by tying and braiding. We know from middle school girls, even before there was middle school, friendship bracelets are something you can make really easily through braiding, right? So it's that kind of jewelry that a peasant could easily wear, or they could trade for something that was maybe higher up, right? So what I'm talking about here in terms of like leather and beads and and braided materials, we're talking about like the lowest peasants could still actually wear stuff that was cool looking or decorative. And beyond that, you could, like I said, you could trade some of your skills for maybe a glass bead that you could add to something else, or you could get something made out of ceramic. We have lots of cool ceramic pendants right now that we can look at. This kind of stuff that's made from leather, wood, ceramics, that kind of stuff, it doesn't always last very well. It doesn't always last as well as the stuff that's made from precious metals. So we don't have a lot of evidence of like peasant adornment necessarily. But I will always say that people like to decorate and they'll decorate their homes as much as possible. They'll decorate themselves as much as possible within their budget. And they'll use really creative means to trade to get things that they want as well. So I don't think we should assume from maybe some of our grade school textbooks that everything that peasants wore was boring or dull or that they never wore anything pretty because, like I said, people enjoy wearing stuff that makes them look good. And so there were plenty of ways to do that, even if you had little to no money in the Middle Ages. Okay, here's a very technical question that you might not need to know unless you write medieval fiction or you read medieval fiction. And if you are just someone who reads medieval fiction, I'm sorry in advance for correcting this etymology because it might bother you for the rest of your life. So this person had a question about the word study. So what do we call a room where people are doing their paperwork in the Middle Ages. Well, people did use the word solar, so you see that sometimes. Closet is something that people used as a room where you would do stuff, especially administrative stuff. Study actually is a word that was used in the Middle Ages from at least the beginning of the 15th century, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. So if you are writing someone in the late Middle Ages who is 
in a place where they're only studying, you can call it a study or you could also call it a closet. But I mean, this is going to be kind of an elite thing because that would be kind of a status symbol to have a room that is just for your work. So this would be something that maybe a merchant might have, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> not everybody has a room that they could just dedicate to that. People would do their work kind of wherever they they wanted. And again, having work that just has to do with paper is kind of, well, an elite thing in some ways because you had to pay for your parchment, but also more of a later medieval thing because that is when people were doing stuff that had more to do with paper, with records, with stuff that is actually written down. So Levi Roach was on the podcast a few weeks ago talking about the rise of paper documentation and he's he talks about it being something that happens definitely after the 12th century it really kind of booms so you wouldn't necessarily never rule it out wouldn't necessarily have a room that was dedicated to just kind of paperwork type office stuff before that if you're writing after that you can call it a closet or you can even call it a study a couple of the questions that I got were really specific to arrows. And if you're interested in medieval arrows, I'm always going to send you to my friend, Will Sherman, who does creates the most amazing medieval arrows and he creates them for a museum. So he's the real deal. And his company is just called Medieval Arrows. I think it's medievalarrows.co.uk, but I will check that. Medieval Arrows, Will Sherman is the person to go to. But people do have a lot of questions about arrows because everybody needed to use them for hunting, for warfare, for sport. So arrows are a big topic. One of the questions I get asked is how long does it take to make an arrow? So again, I'm going to refer you to Will on YouTube. He and my friend Tom Timbrell did a competition where they saw how quickly they could each make one of their items. Tom Timbrell is also a person who teaches in the master class. He teaches about blacksmithing and he created a, a medieval nail, which is pretty cool to see. And Will created an arrowhead and Will's arrowhead was created in less than four minutes, I think. So if you were somebody that was creating arrowheads all the time, you could create them very, very quickly, especially if you're always making the same style. Someone like Will makes different styles of arrowhead because he worked kind of with the whole Middle Ages. Someone who is just creating one for a battle, for a siege, for something like that is always going to make the same kind for the most part, or maybe two, maybe three different kinds of arrowhead. And when you're that much of a specialist, you know, you can make it pretty quickly. The question that I was asked was, do you always need a specialist to make arrows? Well, yeah, pretty much if you want to make ones that will fly well. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a story about Edmund Hillary, who is the guy who climbed Everest. He created his own bow and arrow and, and took down a squirrel. But I mean, if you want a good arrow, you pretty much need a specialist for that. So not only will they make a great arrowhead, a great shaft for it, but also they need to understand the fletching. And for fletching, I'm not a super expert on this, but I can tell you that you'd need the flight feathers of a bird. So you can't actually use whatever feathers you want on a bird. You can only make a few arrows out of a bird because you need just the flight feathers. You need specific feathers. So that's not something that everybody knows off the top of their head. Even in the Middle Ages where you saw arrows being created fairly often, you wouldn't necessarily know which feathers to use and you wouldn't necessarily know how to fletch them well. There's a specific way to glue them on. This is something that Will has recreated himself. So he's an expert in this. The short answer is you pretty much need an expert to create your arrows all the time, unless you're somebody who was trained by an expert and you have some of that knowledge in your back pocket. Not everyone can create an arrow out of nothing. It's actually a skill that you need to learn. And so if you have a character that needs to create an arrow in a pinch, that's somebody that should have been trained kind of off stage, as we talked about in the master class, trained off stage to learn how to do that so that they actually have the expertise to create one. One of the other questions I was asked is like, did you reuse the arrowheads that, were, that fell in the battlefield? Not really. They were often damaged and it's probably easier if you can make one in a, about five minutes or less to just make ones that you know are going to work, that you know are going to stay on. They are glued on 
to the uh, arrow shaft. So you want to use ones that are not necessarily damaged. It's not always better to recycle, even though <laughs> recycling is good in some ways. It's not always good when it comes to arrowheads. And the last question is, someone asked, can you shoot into an arrow slit from really far away and actually like hit somebody inside a window? And so let's talk about long shots for a second. First of all, could you do it on purpose? That would be extremely difficult and you probably wouldn't get it on the, the first try, even if you were a magical expert. Could you get it in there by a fluke? Sure, of course you could. And I remember talking to Dan Jones about this. I've talked about this before. He and I were talking about the Templars, I think it was a few years ago when that book came out. And he was working on a nonfiction book about the Templars. And he was also working on a TV show about the Templars. And they were not the same, obviously. One fiction, one nonfiction. And he said to me, like, we, it's not our job to be the fun police. We shouldn't be the fun police. And so I think about that a lot when I talk to people who are creating medieval fiction. You can create stuff that is fictional, right? So if you have a, an epic archer and they are just the best archer that ever lived, you know, putting Robin Hood to shame, they can shoot through an arrow slit that's super far away. Why not? Why not? It's fiction. We all like to believe stuff that is not necessarily realistic or believable. So when I talk about these actual details of medieval life, it's important to remember that fiction can have a bit of license, right? When we're talking about nonfiction, we want to probably not have an arrow, make it through an arrow slit that's three stories up, especially when you know, it might be dark or windy, but if it's fiction, go right ahead and have your archer make a long shot. Why not? It makes a better story. So those are all the questions that I wanted to answer for you today, kind of pulled from the masterclass. So if you think this is something that you're interested in, let me tell you a little bit more about it. I've talked about a couple of the experts that are in it, but let me start from the beginning. So this is something that I created because I really feel like there's a hole in the market, I guess, for lack of a better word, there's a whole maybe education for people who need really specific tactile details, those three-dimensional things that are hard to see on your own, hard to find on your own, that you can be talked through by an expert. So people who are trying to describe things in their novels, like what does it look like? How does a skirt move? How does a blacksmith work? What does the actual arc of the swing of the blacksmith's hammer look like? This is the kind of stuff that I wanted to help bring to people. So what I did was created a six-week online course, and I teach two of the classes live on Zoom. So the ones that I do, because I'm a generalist and not you know, a specialist, I talk about daily objects because I really like that stuff, and I show some of the replica objects that I have, also pictures I've taken from museums to really talk people through the things that your characters would touch during the day, right? So what does a cup look like? What does a comb look like? What does a writing tablet look like? That kind of stuff. Then next, we have a class that's all about food. And that's taught by Beth Rogers, who is a PhD student in Iceland. So she teaches and she researches food in Iceland. And she explains kind of the cultural history of food in the Middle Ages. And then she actually creates some and she feeds some to her really adorable husband, Frothi, who eats it and you get to see what it looks like. Because we have textual information about medieval food, but it's rare that we see it. So Beth Rogers does that. And I actually have another expert on deck who is going to do more stuff about medieval food. But until that is 100% in the bag, I'm going to keep that under wraps for now. But stay tuned because there's going to be more on medieval food in the masterclass if you're interested in that. Then we have Ken Monshine who writes very often for Medievalist.net. He talks about combat. So he talks about a bunch of things which he thinks are important for fiction writers. So some, he goes through what his armor looks like, some of the improvements in armor over time. He talks about warfare, kind of what that might look like, women in warfare. And then he talks you through some of his favorite and least favorite battle scenes in medieval movies, which is a good time as well. Added to that, we have Guy Windsor, who goes through and actually shows you, demonstrates some of the fighting techniques that were being done in the late Middle Ages. So you can actually see some of the moves as they happen so that you have an idea of what that looks like. 
So Guy Windsor is another expert that I have to show you what sword fighting would look like, at least how it was trained and written down in the Middle Ages. And again, this is something that you want to play with when you're actually writing fiction, but this is really cool stuff to see. Then my friend Tom Timbro from Big Banyan's Blacksmithing, that's a tongue twister for you, he talks about blacksmithing, obviously. Tom is someone I met at the Chalk Valley History Festival where he created an Iron Age sword in just a couple of days that was sharp enough and strong enough to cut through a deer carcass. So Tom is the real deal. And he talks about blacksmithing in terms of what their role was in the community, what they might have looked like. And then he actually makes some stuff for you in a medieval forge, which is really cool to look at. Then there's Katrin Kanya, who I mentioned as well, who talks about textiles, how they were made, what the technology was, what the system was for creating things. So she talks about how to make thread out of wool, out of linen, how you actually card it, how you spin it, and how you weave it. So that is pretty amazing stuff. And she actually shows you the drape of some of it as well. My favorite part of that is you get to see the colors of the dye stuff. So, and then we finish off with me talking about architecture, landscapes, and soundscapes. So what does it actually look like? So your people are walking along a street or they're walking along a road. What does it look like to them? What does it sound like to them? Because I think these details are really important when you're creating. So in addition to that, people get to ask me questions and I give them a bibliography of all my favorite books, as well as all of the instructors' favorite books. And then we have an alumni group on Facebook where if you've met people and clicked with them, you can talk with them later on. And all of the instructors are on there as well. So I'm really proud of this masterclass. It is something that is a labor of love for me. And it's because of COVID-19 that I was able to create it. So if you're interested in the Medieval Masterclass for Creators, the next one starts on May 7th. So you can sign up for that at MedievalMasterclass.com and you can always ask me questions about it. It's MedievalMasterclass at gmail.com if you have questions about it. But I wanted to share that with you because I've been talking about it on the podcast a few times without actually explaining very much about what's in it. Now, I know that this is not for everybody, especially because things are expensive and times are tough. But if it is for you, feel free to get in touch. In the meantime, if you are better served by the stuff on the podcast, or in addition to the stuff on the podcast, I am happy to bring you this podcast stuff free every week. That said, I said it was going to be kind of a personal day. So let's talk about stuff that's kind of personal. When Peter and I started the podcast, we used ads, as you'll see in the beginning, to kind of fund it because this is time, obviously, it's time out of my week and it's stuff that I have to do. And we have a sound editor as well that we pay to kind of make this better for you. So when we got to a certain point on Patreon, we said we were going to stop having ads. And so we reached that point on Patreon and we keep being asked by outside parties if we want to advertise on it. And the truth is that if we advertise on this podcast, it would make it much easier for me to make a living at it <laughs> to the point at which I could spend more time on it. I could make it better. And more importantly, I want to add closed captioning to that, which I don't have the budget for at the moment. So this is all just to say that I love how much people are listening to this podcast and I'm loving it. And I love how much you are loving it as well. And if it's possible for you to kick in a dollar on Patreon or to get one of our higher rewards, that's really important to keeping this podcast going because <laughs> I'm really resisting this ad thing and I'm going to continue to resist it. But I would really appreciate it if you could help to support this indie podcast by supporting us on Patreon. So I do mention it every week, but in case this is your first week listening, <laughs> if this is your first week listening, this is not what all of them are normally like. But if this is your first week listening or you don't know what's on our Patreon, let me just tell you, we do have a book club where we send out books on a monthly basis at a certain level of your patronage. We also have maps, which are really, really cool. These are custom maps that are made for us on Patreon by Tina Ross, and they're different every month. We have ones that are about Asia right now, which is so rare to find, I think, especially places online. And you get these in really high quality images every month. We also have subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine, as you know, which I've written for and a lot of the experts that you hear on the podcast have written for. 
as well, especially Kelly DeVries and Michael Livingston, if you like them. They're often in Medieval Warfare magazine. And the Medieval Magazine, which is run by Sandra Alvarez, who was the other half of Medievalist.net before the two of them created two separate entities. So Peter runs Medievalist.net, Sandra runs the Medieval Magazine. So a lot of the stuff that maybe you loved on Medievalist.net a few years ago, you can find in the Medieval Magazine as well. So there's lots of cool stuff on Patreon. And I just wanted to be transparent with you and mention that people keep asking us to put ads on this podcast and I'm resisting it <laughs> for the sake of everyone that's listening. So if you do have a dollar or so to kick into Patreon, I'd really appreciate that. What else do I need to tell you? Well, before we go, I will let Peter tell you what is on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey, yeah. So the Louvre was back in the news last week is because they actually launched a new digital database. You can look through over like 482,000 items that are in the museum. Nice. If you, you like your museums from home experience, uh, that is something to throw on the bucket list. We also have a guide for avoiding the next pandemic, if that comes. <laughs> We have a piece on the War of St. Sebas, which is like one of the most ridiculous wars ever. Started as a barroom brawl. And we also have the mystery of why a medieval castle can be found in Las Vegas. <laughs> Peter, this is just like a perfect list of randomness that, that really is in keeping with the kind of like month 13 of the pandemic that you and I were just talking about off the air. That's a perfect list, Peter. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> See you later. Bye. So for all of that random awesome content on Medievalist.net, you can follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. And if you're interested in my work as an indie scholar, you can go to my website, which is daniellesabalski.com, or you can follow me on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. You can find my books including pre-ordering the new one, How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life on Amazon. I think that's the only place where you can pre-order it right now, but it is going to be out October 12th. So that is all from me this week. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. I hope you have an amazing day and thank you as always for listening.